Hello, and welcome to The Storied Human. This is Lynn Thompson. I have a great interview today with my friend, David Russell. I met him through another friend on, I think it was LinkedIn, and we just got friendly and started trading um, writing. He writes uh, beautiful stories, and he has a great life story, too, to share. And when we realized it, I scheduled this interview. He's semi-retired. He lives in Michigan. And he is an author, as I said, of fiction and and he's visually impaired, which I didn't realize, which is such a testament to um, the support that social media and programs can give us. We can we can get on there and I didn't have a clue. So he's got a really interesting story. Uh, he also plays the piano, which I just found out, which, you know, just makes it all the more all the more interesting. So welcome, David Russell. This is your life. <laughs> Why don't you start us out with the piano? Because that's fascinating. Piano has been a part of my life since I was three years old. Uh, at the time, we were living on a farm in rural Michigan. And my second cousin uh, was a farmer and also had a music store later on in life. And he would come over and put me on his lap. I don't have any memory of this, but this is a story I've heard a hundred times. Put me on his lap and teach me to play where he had a little hammer. Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater. And then as I aged, I learned how to play by ear. And uh, I played TV things and uh, school fight songs or whatever was popular that day. Now, uh, I can remember when I was about nine or ten, I do every week with the top ten songs were for that given week <laughs> and my parents didn't have a clue and I, I would say to them you are so dumb you don't even know the top 10 <laughs> <laughs> and of course I don't know it now. <laughs> so I, I regressed in some way I guess since I was 10 but anyway uh, in college you know, I did have lessons through school but like Every other kid, I didn't like to practice that much. Uh, and I always preferred learning new songs by ear rather than there is a system called Braille Music, but I never quite caught on or gravitated to it. So in, in college, I put myself through school playing a couple of different routes. I went to Michigan State and Wayne State. And also a college, a Christian college, Detroit Bible College. But I put myself through playing for different restaurants in town and, and uh, have done that off and on probably since I was 20 years old. And I just turned 70 in February. And I'm semi retired. And mm -hmm. I work four days a week, Thursday through Sunday. A restaurant called the Voyage in the same way we uh, I've been there for three or four years uh, because our area doesn't have the greatest public public transportation. Quite remarkable for not only doing that, but just remarkable as a person too. So piano has been a big part of my life. Uh, the two most requested songs for me are either American Pie or Piano. <laughs> oh, I love it. You know what strikes me about this is that cousin gave you such a gift for your whole life. Yeah, he did. He did. His name was Clarence. He was an easygoing guy. Um, well, like a lot of people, me too. In the day, he played accordion in his adult life. He subsidized his income uh, playing for dances and that type of thing. So we we. With, uh, I've never been a farmer. <laughs> the only thing I ever grew was philodendron, and, and somebody told me that those are pretty tough plants. So <laughs> yeah. it didn't require a lot of attention. It was just did a thing of the plant. So that's that's the best thing I've known. Philodendron. <laughs> he was a, a, a dairy farmer, and um, as were my. We 
I grew I was born in Decker, uh, Sandusky, Michigan, and we lived near a little town called Deckerville, which is basically farming country up there. So dad and my uncles were farmers back in that region, and dad moved, but he had studied electricity, and we moved to, when I was a child, I, went, I started out in nursery school, Try to keep it simple. <laughs> um, <coughs> and the county where we moved to had a, a program for five or six blind students who are probably lived within a 20, 30 mile radius of Marysville, where the school is, was. And we started out together and then gradually, by the time we were in fifth grade, we were pretty much in the way down classroom every day with our peers. So that's uh, good. Yeah. I didn't know if they did that everywhere, but that's really good. Didn't give up a farm actually my grandparents moved back to it. <laughs> wow. I know it's tough uh, to give up a farm. It's it's more of a calling and a total yeah. lifestyle than a job. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh he did well in business in fact my brothers are running the business he started he has to go today. What a great start. That's what I'm hearing. And I'm also hearing that your family sticks with things, you know. I, I mean, your father changed careers, but look at what happened. He stuck with it, and yeah. now your brothers are running it. That's not everybody's story. It's a wonderful story, actually, that yeah. there's such continuity and and such um, persistence in your family. Yeah. And it, it sounds like you were really supported as a child, you know, struggling with a disability. Your parents made sure they found that school for you. And and you got integrated. Now, what was it like going to school in fifth grade, like joining that world, like with sighted people? That must not have been easy. It wasn't easy because on one hand, uh, when you're that age. So we lost David's audio for a brief period on this part of the interview. And he talked about re-entering or entering for the first time regular school with sighted students and how it worked out, but it was difficult at first because this, the games that were popular back then were games he really couldn't participate in. And he got around that by doing other things that he could do, including entertaining people with the piano. So once again, the piano came in handy. Demarcation, if you will, this is where I could be in that and where I wouldn't be in that. That's, that's uh, really interesting. Also, fifth graders, especially back then, because I'm only six years younger than you, um, we were not taught, you know, we were not taught about um, children who have disabilities. It just wasn't, we weren't told about right. how to treat somebody or how to be, you know, a, a little more flexible with someone. So there was a real... Um, it was in its infancy, I think, integrating people into yeah. the regular classroom. So also none of us are very nice when we're 10. So, <laughs> so I'm just wondering how that went. But um, I'm, I'm just really uh, struck by how supportive your parents were and, yeah. and the experiences that you had and ended up at college. Now, what was going to college like? Uh Going to college, I thought, were the most terrible years of my life, to be honest with you. Oh, I'm so sorry. In, in retrospect, I can understand how people call them the best years of your life. Uh, part of it was I kind of had a distorted view of what college life would be like. Um, my games were pretty strong, but one little minor, whatever you want to go minor irritation, if you want to call it that, was, uh, and you probably heard this too, if your mother would say, or whoever's disciplinarian is, when you're growing up, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> so, yes, I did. <laughs> there was, there was, I had this picture of a daughter and it's free flowing, stay up late, <laughs> have all sorts of things. Not party, 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 but just kind of this image of, uh, Childhood sucks, but when you get to be an adult, you know, <laughs> the whole world's your life. And so I kind of expected college to sort of be like that, too. That I'd have all sorts of friends, and I'd be a, 
I'd be popular with the girls. <laughs> so I played the piano, and uh, uh, you know, I was I I had I think they probably were some of the best years of my life looking back, even though living them they felt like just a ongoing struggle to to experience this grown up sense of freedom and <laughs> right. It's, all that type of thing. it's a tough uh, age. It is. I mean, even if you enjoy your college years, it's just, it's difficult to be in your, you know, 18 to 22. It's just a difficult um, time. You're growing. It's now they call it the second adolescence. They didn't call it that when we were young. Um, I mean, literally psychologists literally say you change so much from 18 to 22. It's like the second adolescence. And so it makes it a little crazy that, you know, we go to college then, and some people get married right out of college and, you know, you're barely grown up. Now we understand you're barely grown up. But um, yeah, I remember it being very tumultuous. Um, you know, people were still sort of, some people let out of their homes were just <laughs> not ready. <laughs> so did you meet, did you meet your wife in college or was that after? And she's, she's a few years younger than myself. Uh, I didn't have the cradle that I came with. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is, we're talking now 1995. Um, I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time. I had lived there for 11 years. Uh, moved there. Uh, I should just tell you about my autobiography. That's okay. Uh, I, 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 in, I was living in Washington and she came out for a conference. And, and she worked as a, a, a nurse. She's a nurse practitioner now, but then she was, uh, she's going to shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> she, she worked as a local hospital as a counselor and also a nurse. And I can't remember what the technical title was. Um, and she was also starting her own business. But anyway, she came to Washington, D.C. for a conference, and they sent her out with the box of cookies for me. And we met uh, over dinner. And then uh, she stayed in Washington for the weekend because back then it was cheaper to fly home on a Sunday or Monday. Right. So she stayed over. We went out to a movie on Friday. Spent the day together on Saturday. She called me the next Thursday because there was a, the first snowfall here and asked me if I wanted a snowball fight. <laughs> and then a half hour later, I said, You know, I think I could get time to spend the rest of my life with you. Interested. Oh my gosh. And it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it does happen like that, doesn't it? It happens right away. Yeah, so we've been married. It'll be 26 years in September. That's uh, a wonderful story. I love that. Yeah. I found a little interesting statistic recently from this is from the uh, Perkins School for the Blind. They, they're based in Massachusetts, but they have this, they have this old. Fact thing, uh, ten, little, ten little known facts about blindness, and this ties into our story. Our story. It says uh, people who are blind are often lucky in love. Sixty-five percent of Americans who are blind are married or live with a partner, and only sixteen point five percent have the parents. So wow. I consider myself one of the lucky. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? Yeah. Yeah. And why do you think that is? One of my friends said uh, they got married. He said, you know, you're marrying a woman with a psychology degree, so you'll never win an argument. <laughs> 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 I, I think we, we, we always communicate before things become. Uh, and I just 
I just hear that you're a great match, but I was also wondering why so many visually impaired people are lucky in love. And I'm thinking it might have something to do with when you have to deal with something like a disability. I think that you, I don't know, you have more depth. You show who you really are. You're just different, you know, because you did the work. So she saw that. She saw somebody who was real and somebody who had some, some depth to him. I'm yeah. so interested in in how that happens, you know, that those things shape us so much. Those yeah. those those supposed yeah. negatives, they shape us into these they polish us, you know, like a gem. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you you have a great marriage. Now you adopted two children? We adopted two children. Uh they're adults now. And we're grandparents. That's so cool. Uh, our son has two children and our daughter has two. And uh, we probably get together with him. Two, three times a year. In fact, we were just there for our grandson's third birthday. And then their youngest is about eight months old, and we met him for the first time. Uh, they're both charming little boys. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> they their that sounds wonderful. Now, does yeah. your does your wife still work? She still works. Uh, she's a nurse practitioner and a counselor or a psychotherapist. Runs around the agency now, has for 20 years. Uh, she's been supervised 20 people beyond me. <laughs> I worked as a music therapist in, in middle adulthood. Time I was 28 till 34, 35 years old. So tell us, because I'm not that familiar with what music therapy involves and who you who you work with. Could you just tell us a little more about it? Um, Yes, I can. I when I was in Michigan State, I I actually when I was at Wayne State, I started out in music therapy. Uh, there was a Christian singer who was also blind by the name of Ken Beatham, who um, went to Michigan State, but then his first music therapy job was in Montclair, New Jersey. Oh yeah, I, I believe it's called Montclair. Yep. Yeah, um, and a friend had given me his records, and I thought, oh, that's cool. And I, I, uh, I could combine music and I could uh, combine being in the helping profession. Uh, and to me, that was just the coolest help. It wasn't easy getting there. Um, when I was in college, I wanted to be a voice major instead of a piano major because I was partly sick and tired of being a piano man. <laughs> I thought, I'll try to be an opera singer. <laughs> and I remember... I, I, I flunked my first place jury, oh. and the report cards came home from college, and my dad read me mine. He said, oh, you've got an old voice. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and little did I know that old was zero. <laughs> Aww. And then somehow I got it together enough to succeed at that major. And then and I, since I finished early, I went back to piano, and thought I should have stayed with that. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to know when you're young, right? Yeah, yeah. I can still hear you know, one of the instructors after my piano career. I was a piano player. <laughs> when you've played as long as you have, like from the time you were a really young child, it's easy to just say, eh, and take it for granted. But because you've played that long, you yeah. know, you've got a jump on everybody. It's not like you picked it up in adulthood. I mean, you've been playing your whole life. Right. But back to music therapy. Yes. Uh, music therapy is a means where you design a program of treatment for somebody based on what their diagnosis is or, or uh, interest is. For, for, for two years, I worked with the Bound and Steer Valley Retirement. Um, I would have preferred working more with uh, psychology, psychological illnesses and mental illnesses. I'm not sure what words have changed because I've been away from that profession for so long. Uh, but anyhow, I worked with the severe and profound memory retention. Uh, they were adults, basically, with two and three year old boys. So the activities we did with them, I did with them, for example, uh, playing the auto heart together. Uh, I might have them strong and I press the buttons or devices or uh, do a little dancing or do a little rhythm type activity. But the whole, the, the premise behind that is that you do something with music, you're building yourself confidence 
your self esteem, uh, your ability. I, in fact, I've had a funny story to tell you. <laughs> Good. Um, I took a group of people that I went with to a recital at University of Florida uh, because back then they wanted, there was a big push for promoting normalization. And all of us, I had one client who was like someone up to me. Uh, so the, the first student, I guess came on stage, said piano, all was quiet, and this man yells out, Up the major dragon! <laughs> <laughs> but the recital went on. <laughs> Nobody laughed. Or, Aww. You know, off, but <laughs> <clears throat> and, uh, some behaviors never change. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I, you know, I'm looking at your life right now, and I'm thinking it's like a quilt. You know, it's like yeah. a quilt. So many different pieces. Now, how did you get into writing? Did you always like to write or was that later? I, actually, when I moved back to Michigan, I um, had worked for, I worked and lived in Washington, D.C. for 12 years. And for nine years, I played, you know, I um, and got hired a lot of, of Washington, and then of course I met Sherry and moved back here, but I'm thinking of moving back to where I grew up uh, even before I met her. Mm -hmm. um, but when I, I, I do suggest a medical transcription or a court reporting, and so I went into medical transcription from 1998 now, and worked as activity aid at a nursing home in our area and transcribed for their doctor. Um, they had a full-time doctor at the time who would take care of the residents. Um, and I did his transcription notes and then laid over for service. I did that till 2013 and then in uh, 2013, I retired from that, and uh, uh, boy, this is the first time since I was five years old that I've had 24 hours a day to structure. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is a challenge, I would imagine. And I thought, you know, I might try story writing. I don't know where I'll go, but there was a group online called Writer 750. In fact, they're still on web reads. And um, you could join, there was no fee, but the whole object means uh, write a story on it, on a selected theme for that month. And uh, the, the only rule was that it had to be at least 750 words long. So we're, we're talking flash fiction. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I thought, you know, I, I kind of like this. It, it was it was a hobby, uh, and then somebody published an anthology in that group, and I got to be in an anthology. That's <laughs> so cool. That, that is, you know, it's harder to write something short. It's really yeah. hard to write a good short piece. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> Now my stories are 1,500 to 2,000 words. I thought, I'll never get there. <laughs> and you got there. Yeah. At the beginning of that, yeah. 2013, that's <laughs> a pretty tall order, I thought. <laughs> so I think of you as a writer. You're definitely a writer. And I'm so encouraged for our listeners to hear that you can find, you can have different careers. And you can find yeah. the thing that really resonates with you. One of the things, right? I feel like writing really resonates with you. You can find it a little bit later in your career. So I I think it's, it's encouraging, also, you know? It's also, it's also a big because we, we live in a kind of a rural area. So we're not that far away from me to be involved with other people. I mean, there's other people are. I never really know unless Right. Um, that's a way to, to be socially involved. Right. Well, when I write, and then somebody was just asking this on one of the 
sites I, I read and it said, do you write for yourself or do you write for others or do you, and I think that real writer, or do you write to be published, whatever, real writers write um, primarily for themselves and, but not just for themselves because you're always looking to connect. I yeah. think that's what's so beautiful about it. And when I don't need a lot of people to read my writing, I'm on medium, you know, and, mm-hmm. and I put a lot of stuff up there. And as long as I have one or two people who say, yeah, this really hit me. I mean, personally, it's great if people want to be published and go crazy and, you know, that's all great. And I might do that someday. But for me, the essence of writing is that communication, that connecting. And for someone to say to me, this just hit me. I know this feeling to me, that's everything. And that's what we're seeking. And, you know, believe it or not, I live in New Jersey, but I'm in a very rural area. I'm really, really close to the Delaware River. And we have farms all around us. Like I can relate to so much of your story and yeah, we are a little isolated, you know, even though New York is really close, um, our day-to-day life is kind of country-ish. And so to have that big wide world that social media gives you, it's pretty special. And I love that you're finding that, you know, because we don't need to be isolated. And also I feel like everybody needs to, to use the gifts that God gave them. You know, it's so, it's almost an obligation. You know, you it's not up to you to set it aside. That's how I feel. Like, I just feel like if I'm not moving forward and growing and using the gifts that God gave me, then I'm not yeah. like, why am I alive? You know, it's like, right. so to me, I hear you using those gifts. It makes me really happy. Go to the restaurant and eat your breakfast. Uh, are you finding that moving your life that there's people that kind of have the double-sided life? Yeah, I do see that more. Although I'm still in the corporate world. You know, I work for Verizon as a tech writer and I'm a consultant. So I've worked all over the place, kind of have mm-hmm. gigs. Um, but I've been at Verizon for a while now. And um, so that's a different atmosphere. But um you know, when I talk to people from my podcasting class, they're all doing several things, you know, like one of them is a therapist and she's got this podcast and she has plans to be um, a coach, like that kind of thing. And to me, I like hanging out with those kind of people because even though I've enjoyed my career and I get a lot of um, fulfillment out of it, as I'm older now, I see that I need to, again, pay attention to what, you know, God gave me, which is sure. this creative side, and it's time to to let that flower. And I think when you when you move towards creative sides, you don't tend to work full time. You know, you you tend to patch something together, and so right. that's definitely something I relate to. And I do see it in the, this new crop of people. I mean, I have so many more friends now from the podcasting class, and that's like a side effect. I didn't know I would have this group to go through it wow. with, and it's lovely. Yeah. And, um, you know, I pulled Robin into it because, you know, I met you through Robin Ryback right. and she was my very first interview and it was so great. She, mm. we went to college together and she agreed to do that. And I just, she was nervous about it and stuff. And I'm like, Robin, I don't even have a podcast yet. It's going to be great. You know, I really appreciate it. So she was yeah. brave, you know, she, but she's so funny. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I liked being able to show people how funny she is. Because I remember laughing hysterically for my entire senior year. <laughs> She's just one of those quick people, you know, that it's very funny. Anyway, I'm getting off the track. But yes, I do see people piecing together their lives um, and, and having more than one career. I think in general, people have more than one career. I mean, I think you were, you know, early to do that. People do that, you know, in, as far as doing it back then. Right. But um, people do it. Nobody has one career now. Everybody has a bunch. Yeah. And um yeah. and things look different at different ages, you know, like in my 30s I got married and I was worried about saving money and we wanted to have kids and it's just different. You know, you stick with one job and you you work it out. And then when you yeah. get older you're like, "Hey, I never let this part of myself out. Maybe I should, you know." Mm-hmm. So I love that you found writing and I I love that you're doing. I mean, you're doing it. You're getting published and you're yeah. working on 
on, you know, major longer than 750 words. It's great. (laughs) (laughs) So I wanted to say something about, it was a little difficult setting this interview up for us. And do you want to tell our listeners why? Uh, Facebook call, and I'm not the most savvy person in the world. Part of that, I think, is because we're moving as a society from uh, phone support to something where you can call and say, hey, how do I do this? So can you run on into my computer? Now we're moving to do it yourself, even with cable TV. Yeah. Can I tell one funny story? Sure. Related to Comcast, and both my wife and I went to watch the you know the college football and NFL football, and all the names were in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and we had no idea how to how to change that back to English. So for half the football season, we had to tell them we. Spanish, even everybody loves reading was in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we like watching those reruns. But it turned out that all we needed to do was change the cable box. But getting to that solution was like, <laughs> right. And the computer for me is like that because there's, I, being vision impaired, um, there's something, even though I go on to vision impaired forums, uh, there's something kind of unique about blind people and that, well, I figured out how to do it, and it's for me, so you figure out how to do it, and it works for you. But we don't want to tell each other how we figure it out. Um, That's hard. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That's hard. Work. So I, uh, Discover different support systems that are not support groups, but accessibility uh, groups, if you will. Uh, there's one in Australia called Ability.net. Uh, over here, we have the American Foundation for the Blind. Uh, is one where you would say to the group. We'll post tutorials about what the iPhone is. Well, I felt bad because I didn't realize, like I said, it's kind of cool. It's not obvious that you're visually impaired. So that means the computers, you know, and social media does work to some degree for you to have a totally abled presence. But on the other hand, I noticed um, how hard it was for us to, to do this and how these programs are not set up for you to easily find a way to use them. And what I'm concerned about, and you got me thinking about it, is that more and more interfaces are touch screens, which yeah. totally sucks for you. It's just as bad as a mouse, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so it made me more aware. And I hear this from another friend I have where she she finds that, um, you know, she's using a wheelchair more and more. And she reports because she's a lawyer. So it's good. She reports more and more on places that you know, maybe they've instituted something like a, like a ramp, but they never tested it. You know, there might be like a lip at the beginning of the ramp that makes it really hard for people to get onto the ramp. And so I come from IT where all we do is, you know, build software and test it. And then I write about it. I don't understand why we don't have more user testing and why also, by the way, why there's not more sharing, like you said, they don't really share solutions. I'm not sure why that is. So you made me aware of this in a way that I wasn't before. So I'm grateful for that. And I'm sure you noticed I'm like a dog with a bone. When somebody gives me a problem, I just keep, I just keep banging on it until I figure it out. But um, that's really my, my IT training and working with computers. If you're not someone that can just keep banging on something, you'll never make it, you know, it's like, you'll, you'll never figure it out. So I really appreciate your patience your willingness to try different things. And um, it's been a delight talking to you. I'm so glad that we were able to make this work. I am too, Lynn. So, um, definitely. And if you want to mention where we can find your stories, that would be great. Uh, 
earlier I mentioned the uh, memoir that I wrote in 2018. Uh, it's called uh, Homecoming, and you can find it on Amazon or Snapforms. That's fantastic. Uh, and that address is www.stillworks, that's one word, dot com, uh, slash author, slash David C. Russell, type is one word, no period. It's -E -E that's great. And I'll, I'll put those. That's great. I'll put those in the show notes too. And if there's anything else you think of, we'll include that. Cause I have the show notes after the, um, you know, accompanying the recording of this interview. So it'll tell people a little bit more about you, like we talked about, and I'll include these, Thank you. these things. So way to go. It's, it's 11 Oh one. I know you have to go. <laughs> Thank you again. <laughs> bye bye. You have a super day. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hi, I wanted to add to the interview that you can find all of David's um, information about where to find his writing in the show notes that accompany uh, this episode. The audio was a little sketchy at the end. Um, most of the interview was fine, so I just wanted to make sure we retained this audio and that if you need more information, you can look at the show notes. Thank you so much, and I'll see you on The Storied Human.